Triumphant in their victory at Pearl Harbor, Japanese naval forces sweep across the Pacific, virtually unchallenged. As America rebuilds a decimated naval force, its only hope of containment lies with a small task force of carriers, cruisers, and battleships. Survival will depend on the Navy's ability to hit far-reaching targets before they themselves are attacked. Both sides will heavily rely on their aircraft carriers to achieve success in this crucial showdown over the Coral Sea. Until early in 1941, the Japanese planning for war with the United States had been to use the main fleet to progressively destroy American forces as they were deployed in support of the garrison in the Philippines. That was the move that the U.S. planners were expecting. Admiral Yamamoto had conceived the preemptive strike on Pearl Harbor and had overseen it. It was, of course, a brilliant success, and in little over an hour, the Imperial Navy seemed to have gained control of the Pacific. The United States Pacific Fleet still retained considerable strength. The carriers, 16 cruisers, and large numbers of submarines and destroyers were undamaged. It was therefore still possible to assemble task forces around the flat tops. The Japanese moved with determined and awesome speed. Their aims were to gain control of oil fields and other supplies of strategic materials and to establish concentric defenses around the home islands. The optimistic expectation was that the Allies would suffer such heavy losses in attacking the outposts that Japan would keep her empire in a negotiated peace. This depended on two misconceptions, the mood of America and the strength of the defensive perimeter in the face of the U.S. carriers. In the following months, the Japanese tides swept Asia. The Philippines were attacked within hours of Pearl Harbor, with unopposed occupations of two islands in the first week of the war. With the exception of some B-17s and P-40s, the American airplanes in the Philippines were obsolete, and the Japanese quickly achieved an aerial supremacy that ensured them a victory. The last defenders surrendered on June the 6th, 1942. It had fallen to the American carriers to hold the line as the only force left with any capability to hit back. Almost as soon as Yorktown was sent to the Pacific, Saratoga was torpedoed and withdrawn for repairs. And so the U.S. deployed three carrier task groups under Admirals Halsey, Fletcher, and Brown. In the face of the weight of Japanese sea power, this handful of ships went on the offensive. Obviously, raids by single carrier task forces were not going to halt the Japanese advance. However, given the circumstances, it was the best course available. The mobility of the carriers allowed a rapid succession of attacks, great distances apart, by single groups or formations of forces. From the 1st of February, 1942, raids went on over the entire Japanese front. Simultaneous attacks were mounted against the Marshall Islands and the Gilberts. The Japanese land-based air forces threw themselves at their tormentors furiously, with little success. In March, there were further operations against Marcus and Wake, and then Enterprise and Lexington attacked targets in New Guinea. These operations brought the American crews invaluable battle experience. They were able to confirm their faith in dive bombing's effectiveness. They were also able to realistically assess the strengths of the Japanese planes and adopt tactics accordingly. They made some very heartening discoveries about weaknesses in the Japanese equipment and methods. One factor that was to prove important was the Japanese lack of radios. The air commanders were unable to direct their pilots, and groups of Japanese planes entering battle were enthusiastic but uncoordinated, often resembling a cavalry charge. <laughs> 
one unnerving feature recorded almost as soon as the first attacks on the carrier task forces was that Japanese pilots, if their plane was shot up and doomed, would try to crash the aircraft into the biggest ship in reach. The raids didn't do much damage, and the Japanese continued to make advances. But they now had to tie up some of their resources in defense to strike back at the carriers and their opponents were increasingly battle experienced. The value of the news of these minor successes to the morale of the American public was enormous. In the face of almost daily reverses, the sailors and airmen were the promise of eventual retribution. The carrier Hornet had been in the Pacific since January, but she had not been deployed to the fleet. She had been held on the west coast while some very irregular training went on with B-25 medium bombers. When satisfied that the pilots could get the overloaded bombers off the short takeoff on the carrier, the ship left port for a rendezvous with Enterprise, north of Hawaii, on the 13th of April, 1942. With their screen of cruisers, they headed through stormy seas towards Tokyo. Commanding the air group of 16 bombers was Army Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. It had three real purposes. One purpose was to give the folks at home the first good news that we had had in World War II. It caused the Japanese to question their warlords. And from a tactical point of view, it caused the retention of aircraft in Japan for the defense of the home islands when we had no intention of hitting them again seriously in the near future. Those airplanes would have been much more effective in the South Pacific where the war was going on. A Navy captain named Lowe conceived the idea of taking Army medium bombers off of a Navy carrier and attacking Japan. The B-25 was selected because it took off and handled very well. First, I found out what B-25 unit had had the most experience, and then went to that crew, that organization, and uh, called for volunteers. And the entire group, including the group commander, volunteered. The B-25s had a range far greater than the carrier's planes. The Japanese had picket boats watching for a carrier strike, but they never imagined one that could be launched 700 miles from the target. Doolittle had to hope, meantime, that they were not sighted until they were in range. If we were intercepted by Japanese surface or aircraft, our aircraft would immediately leave the decks. If they were within range of Tokyo, they would go ahead and bomb Tokyo, even though they would run out of gasoline shortly thereafter. That was the worst thing we could think of. And uh, if we were not in range of Tokyo, uh, we would go back to Midway. If we were not in range of either Tokyo or Midway, we would permit our airplanes to be pushed overboard so the decks could be cleared for the use of the carrier's own, carrier Hornet's own aircraft. A Japanese picket boat spotted them 200 miles short of their planned takeoff on the morning of the 18th. Arming of the planes had already begun, and it was decided to go ahead with the attack on Tokyo. The takeoff run had to be almost impossibly short. Taking off unloaded had been hard enough to begin with. To take off from a carrier's deck in a heavily overloaded B-25 was another matter entirely. The pilots had received intense training from Navy flyers. Light loads at the start, medium load, and then a final a uh, heavy load, which was 2,000 pounds over the maximum designed weight of the aircraft. It was a rough day. The wind was blowing, the seas were pretty high. We had to slow down the Hornet because we had so much wind over the deck and we were taking water over the bow. Jimmy Doolittle was the, the first one. Uh, he, of course, was a, was a track aviator and uh, 
There wasn't a flaw in his technique. And it took uh, one hour to get the rest of the planes on. In Tokyo, reaction to the alarm from the picket boat was rapid and efficient, but wildly wrong. The calculation suggested that the carriers were edging into range to launch a strike in the morning. The range of carrier-based aircraft ruled out an attack that day. Orders were given to prepare strike waves of planes to bomb the ships out of the water in the morning when they would be comfortably in range. The Americans had lost the essential element of surprise and were constructing their own trap, or so it seemed. Precisely the time that the first plane was supposed to be on, the Japanese radio went off the air. And then it came back on me and was uh, talking about the enemy uh, planes over Japan. The actual damage done by the raid was minimal. We were 16 airplanes each carrying one ton of bombs. One crew went to Vladivostok. The other 15 of us proceeded until we got to the coast of China. When we got to China, two airplanes were so low on fuel that they landed in the surf alongside of, of the beach. Uh, two people were drowned. Eight of them got ashore. The weather was quite bad, and uh, so we flew on until we got to where we thought we were as close as we could get to where we wanted to go, having been on Ted Reckoning for quite a while that we weren't precisely there, and then we all jumped. The Raiders deserved the decorations they received. The raid itself was a mere pinprick, but like the earlier carrier raids, it interfered with the Japanese ability to concentrate their forces for continued assaults on the rim of their overblown empire. More and more, the need for defensive bases and protective deployments drained the supplies to the fronts. At home in the States, the men, especially Jimmy Doolittle, became national celebrities. The Pacific carriers prepared for some busy months ahead. Even as Enterprise and Hornet hurried south, the Imperial Japanese Navy was massing the ships for the next move. As with the Pearl Harbor attack, this was meticulously planned, and wide provision was made for contingencies. There had been division over the next step, Yamamoto and the combined fleet staff wanting to attack at Midway while the naval staff favored continued activity to take Port Moresby and the rest of New Guinea and isolate Australia with a thrust through the Solomons at Fiji and New Caledonia. As a compromise, it was decided to do both, with Port Moresby as the first major objective. When the plans were finalized and the orders were issued, the interception and decoding of Japanese messages allowed Admiral Nimitz to make plans to intervene as best as his limited resources would allow. The carriers Yorktown and Lexington, with two groups of cruisers, steamed south. They carried 141 aircraft, 42 fighters, and 99 bombers. The Japanese had several fleets in the area on the 3rd of May. Besides two invasion convoys, there were two other significant groups. The covering force for the Port Moresby invasion, including a light carrier, and a striking force with two large carriers. This powerful formation was there for one purpose, to crush any U.S. Navy ships that may attempt to interfere. One of the invasion groups was landed in the Solomons on the 3rd. But the next day, Yorktown arrived in the area and announced her presence with raids on the invaders. This was in some ways just the news the Japanese wanted, and their carriers hurried south. They had been diverted to ferry planes, and their late arrival was the first of a series of mistakes on both sides in what has become known as the Battle of the Coral Sea. 
the next two days were spent searching for one another without making contact, although at one time the two groups were only 70 miles apart. On the 7th, Yorktown's planes found and sank the light carrier Shoho. The most important facet of that day's activities was the withdrawal of the invasion fleet. A battleground swept by carriers was no place for troop ships. The deferred invasion would in fact never take place. Port Moresby was not to fall, and the Japanese wave of expansion was almost spent. On the morning of the 8th, the two forces finally came to grips. They were fairly evenly matched in terms of planes and ships, and the attacks on both sides were pushed home vigorously. The Japanese had one telling advantage from the elements. A band of thick cloud hid their force. In fact, one of their carriers seems to have gone unobserved all through the engagement. The Americans, on the other hand, operated under a clear sky and both Lexington and Yorktown received a lot of attention. The American planes had scored three hits on the Japanese carrier Shokaku and had badly damaged her. While this raid was in progress, the Japanese had at last found the right target and were attacking. None of the damage they did was of itself fatal, but by the time they left, they had damaged both of the United States ships. Lexington had belatedly been shorn of her redundant heavy artillery. 36 additional anti-aircraft guns had been added to her in previous months. She was still, in comparison to the batteries carried by ships a year later, lightly defended. With the defenses available to her that day, she was certainly unable to protect herself, and she took the worst of the action. Yorktown, nimbler and slightly smaller, attracted less of the Japanese attention, and the damage from her one hit was rapidly contained. The attacking Japanese savaged the Lexington. She took two torpedo strikes and two bomb hits. These started extensive fires and caused havoc on board. But the crew fell too to try to save their ship. She was sorely damaged, not only by the strikes, but also by several very near misses. But the damage control affected stabilized the situation, and things began to look quite hopeful for the battered ship. But of course, we didn't see each other except by. Uh, air. We didn't see the surface forces. Didn't see each other. In most sea battles, normally the opposing forces are inside of each other. In this particular case, they were anywhere from uh, 300 miles to 100 miles away. We made attacks on them and did some damage, which at that time we didn't know, but we caused quite a lot of havoc. And in the meantime, the Japanese had attacked the Lexington and the Yorktown. We put one bomb in the Yorktown flight deck, which did not uh, severely handicap her for landing operations and takeoffs. But the Lexan had received three hits. My squadron, we had uh, been gone so long. I said, we just don't have fuel enough to get to Yorktown. It's better to land on the planing deck, hoping to put the fire out than to land in the ocean and lose all our aircraft. So they let us land with the ship. The decision to retrieve the planes was supported by the belief that Lexington would be saved. The fires were almost all under control. However, she was inadequately ventilated, and the numerous leaks in the aviation fuel supply network were effectively constructing a huge incendiary device as they slowly filled the vessel with vapors. The bucket brigades hauling water would be no match for what was going to happen. No fire pressure on any of the hoses throughout the ship, which was just devastating. So after, uh, oh, maybe two and a half or three hours, it uh, got so bad that uh, Skipper said to abandon ship. The explosions that racked the Lexington as she sank were the sad coda to the engagement. In many ways, the battle was inconclusive. Losses of planes were about the same. The Americans lost only half as many men, but their loss of a fleet carrier gave the Japanese a marginal victory. 
However, the abandonment of Japanese invasion plans meant that, in real terms, the battle outcome had favored the Americans. Both sides had considerably exaggerated their success. The Japanese were sure they had sunk at least two carriers, as were the Americans. By decoding Japanese transmissions, the Americans were able to clarify the situation. The Imperial Navy, however, was to carry its misconceptions into the next engagement, a month later, at Midway. Although they sank more of our ships, they did not get Port Moresby, which was the essential aim of their war plan. So the aircraft carrier uh, involved in, in this battle proved to be the essential instrument. Yet there was another test that was required, whether a, an entire fleet could be knocked out because of the presence of air power. 